Greetings everyone, Caius here for another episode of Oscar Cast. Apologies for the wait on this episode compared to the first episode, I guess, huh? And, uh, because I have been very uh, busy with schoolwork and many, many other things in my life. And, uh, I had migraines recently. I just got over them and it was really, really bad. I, it took a while. That's why it took a while to really write the script for this episode. Uh, these aren't, to, if you're wearing the process of these episodes, they're not like scripted. I go off of script to like of information. I don't read entirely off of it. It's kind of like a base uh, for my information and such, you know, I just kind of write down information I need and then from there I just, uh, you know, re read it as I think I see fit and all that. But anyway, anyway, enough rambling on about the actual in and out of uh, the Ostracast, uh, how it's made and such, and oh yeah, I just want a little update for everybody. If uh, the audio sounds any different, uh, it's because I've been I'm using a new pra program. I finally got an Audacity to work. The last programs I've been using for uh, recording these episodes have been uh, Zoom and uh, the Xbox, the Xbox Record. Uh, recorder on the my computer. Uh, uh, anyway, let's get on to the episode about the Meiji Restoration, uh, which is a period around the eight, mid eight hundreds where Japan had a revolution against the shogunate, where they they changed from uh, uh, what's it called the the feudal society with the shog shogunate to uh, to uh, the industrialized. Um, I guess some semi modern Japan that we would know from World War One, uh, the Russo Japanese War, and World War Two. But any, those are not the topics here today. But so, uh, but I would like actually give you guys a little bit of fun facts about Japan before we dive too deeply about the Shogunate, the Meiji Restoration, and how Japan and how that all ties into kind of ties a little bit into the right. The rise of Japan as a power in the world during that time is a uh, first little fun fact I like to tell you guys about is actually Japan isn't really known as Japan inside the country in the Japanese language they call themselves a uh, Nippon or Nihon depending on I think depending on the like translation or like Latinization of the word uh, which means land of the rising sun actually actually, which is kind of w because they get the name from a long time ago, relations with China. I I'd rather not get into that today to get distracted. Don't want to get distracted on that. <laughs> and a little another fun fact is the origin of the, of the word shogunate. It actually comes from the word say, hopefully I'm pronouncing this correctly. Uh, apologies to everybody out there who speaks Japanese and if I'm seriously butchering the words, I think I might be pretty sure I am, but I I'm trying my best I pro with what I got. Uh, come, the shogunate comes from the term Sei Tai Shogun, which is, I think, something along the lines of like a, like a repeller of barbarians, or something along those lines, or... Yeah. Uh, I had the translation with me, but it just kind of I lost kind of lost it so apologies for that I'll have to relook that into that so anyway with those little fun facts of the way let us get started on uh, the Meiji restoration which is you know but you know fully understand it first we must talk a little bit about well the shogunate the shogunate or bakufu Japanese uh, mean means tent government like it's because like well, the tent-like structure of society with each uh, class being, you know, kind of, uh, you know, from top to bottom of power. With the shogun, then like the daimyo, which are the local rulers, then uh, underneath them are the, I'm trying to remember then, underneath them are the samurai, which are the, the warriors well known for... For, for uh, like the outsiders like uh, us and Western society know of the samurai and ninja and uh, yeah so that's 
And then below them will be the f the farmers. Then like, I think no 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 aristocracy farmers then merchant class or the bottom of society, which uh, is very interesting. But anyway, it uh, the shogunate for first form at, in 1192 and. Shogunate is a hereditary military dictatorship. Very, it's a very uh, simplified explanation of how the shogunate actually worked, but that's the best way I can put it without going into extreme detail, making this a lot longer than it needs to be. Anyway, so the shogunate formed in 1192, and uh, it had multiple different periods. Uh, there's the Kamakura, which was the first shogunate, the Ashikaga, which is the, obviously the second and most un, actually most uh, tumultuous period of Japan, where uh, with that happened, which ha actually they oversaw what was called the Sengoku Jidai, which is basically the warlord period of Japan, and and which that period actually led to the rise up rising of what was. The final clan, and the clan would be probably focusing on for well, the majority of uh, this uh, this uh, little pres little uh, like eh, little uh, podcast is the Tokugawa uh, clan. Let's say Connie. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did slip of the tongue. Uh, the Tokugawa clan was basically started with by uh, what's it called? I'm trying to remember. His it basically started by this. Well, basically started and actually kind of, kind of made the class structure in uh, Japan even stricter than it was before because uh, uh, Tokugawa, the original guy, the original Tokugawa, he, uh, he, he actually rose through the ranks from like a sim. I think he rose through the ranks from like a simple like a pez kind of peasant type. This is the best way to describe his, describe what he was to, I think, or maybe it was a present. I'm sorry, I, I forgot to write that down. Apologies. He, he re started out as like you know, as like a lower, more lower class, and rose to the ranks to become the shogun, and then he, be then basically made the society where, where the laws where farmers couldn't move from their land because of a, uh, because of you know shortages and many things, and yeah, so. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention what the Sengoku Jidai was. It was. Oh wait, I already said it was like the warlord era where the daimyo fought for control of a uh, Japan. Also, was it called? I forgot to mention when the Tokugawa actually was it called established itself. It actually was like uh, for the description for before where they were very like authoritarian. They controlled pretty much every aspect of uh, Japan at that point. Like. Even to the point where they even so kind of ruined the power of what what power left the emperor had, which was pretty. And he emperor well, I guess at that point was he was already figurehead, but besides the point, uh, the but like the emperor daimyo, even the religious institutions were extremely have extremely controlled by the Tokugawa dynasty during this time in Japan. And, uh, what's it called? They actually oversaw the first interactions with Europeans dur during their rule over Japan. It star started out with the Portuguese and Dutch. And, you know, it started... And Japan was very, uh... Became extremely wary of the Jew... The Europeans. Because, uh... Not only the rise in, uh... The rising Christians in their country... But also due to, like, which they saw as a threat to their life, but also because, uh, they, what the Europeans did to, uh, China pretty much. They pretty much took full control over China if, pre at the time. I mean, not directly, but they, indirectly more or less, by influence and sphere, spheres and such. Though there were tree ports of Hong Kong, uh, Macau and such. So Japan pretty much closed these doors for from like when they first met the Europeans in the sixteen hundreds, yes. in the sixteen hundreds and they 
to all all Europeans except for the Dutch. And that is because the Dutch actually helped the Japanese put down a re rebellion in the Shimabara Peninsula. Which was a, the Shimabara like a revolt with was not only headed by Christians, which were very tired of their persecution in Japan, but also by farmers who were tired of uh, their conditions, because you know they kept they're extremely oppressed by uh, by uh, the Japanese shogunate, the Tokugawa shogunate to be exact. But anyway, so during this time, the shogunate would not allow with the only port of trade in Japan at this time being in the port of Nagasaki. Which, uh, for the probably many out there, you probably know what happened to it later on in history. So, they... So, uh, during this period, 200 years of... The entire... Blah, 200 years of rule they had, it was very peaceful in Japan. I mean, very... Very tense period as well, because the... Because many were getting very tired of the, ins the way the institutions were made and how they were run themselves, but... Was well, very peaceful for Japan, and there's compared to the uh, Chicago and Gaon clan. So, and they ruled from uh, what was Edo, Japan. I think would we call now Tokyo. And during this time, they kind of had a renaissance for the merchant class, but also like you know all and the nobles and such and townspeople. They had like a they had such a, like, you know, all the arts and such with, were flourishing during this time, but what was it called? The shogunate was starting to falter during this time as well, slowly starting to falter because agricultural production was slowly going, slowly go, like, stop, slowly going down, and the stipend for the samurai to not, like, you know, rebel and such were going down in the pet. The peasant class was being very, uh, becoming very wary, as I mentioned before. And this time, Polish's period start, really started to kind of go the tone. The, oh, wait, apologies, I let me focus. But the final nail in the coffin for the shogunate. The shogunate really tried his damnedest to reform all this, but the final nail, the final thing that really destroyed him was one. When one Matthew Perry came into the picture from the U.S., which uh, they give you a little, say, the what's it called? As I mentioned before, the eight in eighteen in the eighteen hundreds, uh, specifically eighteen seventy three, they made a lot of edicts to, you know, make sure no Europeans besides the Dutch could trade with them, and they, and pretty much er, the army and I guess the Soviet oh, samurai were. Were given the explicit mission to expel any fo any foreign powers that weren't coming in through who weren't the Dutch or East Asian like uh, China or Korea or the Dutch like I mentioned before and they expel them if they weren't at the the port of a uh, what's it called <sighs> Frick, dang it uh, the Nagasaki and this was by Tokugawa Imochi yeah. but this didn't turn out well when one Matthew, as I said before, the Matthew Perry came in and, and the U.S. merchant ships were actually um, almost hit by this. And so the U.S. So Matthew Perry said, basically came in around, uh, what was it called, a few years after the Shogun repealed the act, which he repealed in 1842, Matthew Perry, Matthew Perry appeared in 1853. And he gave the Japanese an ultimatum. Either we will crush you with the might of the U.S. Mil US Navy, or you open the, open the port and let, let the U.S., specifically the U.S., trade with Japan. So, yeah. And Iemitsu, uh, again, apologies if I'm mispronouncing anything in this. I do not mean to be offensive. I'm just... I'm trying my best here. <laughs> uh, so he he decided to open the country when they come back, when the Matthew Perry and such came back with more gunboats. He 
Matthew Perry did give him a year, but he came back in half a year, so... Yeah, that was nice. And if this was the start of uh, the unequal tre treaties with uh, not only the U.S., but France, the U.K., and I think even Russia. Yeah, even Russia got a treaty with Japan. This led to what would be called the bar of the consent, many centers of learning for of these, as they called barbarian cultures, which was you know the aforementioned countries. <laughs> It made, though many people were very upset with uh, this change because the uh, the shogunate didn't look extremely weak towards these foreign aggressors. So many were starting so many were starting to plot against the shogunate, which uh, went two of the there are actually two specific daimos that actually would become the main instigators of the fall of the shogunate. Which were the Shishi and the Satsuma, which would, which are from, I mean, uh, the Shishi, were, which were samurai from the Satsuma and Choshu eras. Apologies, I, I messed that up a little bit. They believed Japan was a sacred realm, and then the tree, and the trees infringed on the sacredness of Japan, and uh, what was it called? They thought it was a cri pretty much a crime that the shogun just did this without Amber's permission because. They believe the emperor must be involved in all decisions, and he was before. He kind of gave him a blessing, kind of, to put it like a uh, Queen Victoria does to the Parliament today in uh, the UK. But besides the point, uh, so they so they went with the policy called uh, again apologies if I mispronounced this. So no joy, revere the emperor and expel the foreigners. Comey, uh, the emperor at the time really agreed with this policy, and he, and he actually, uh, fosters, kind of fostered their, but, well, I guess it gave him moral support, and, uh, to, to reorient Japan towards the original direction of isolation and, uh, of, of the, what's it called, again, from the foreigners, and from, from every, every country that they didn't want to be, uh, what's it called, dang it, I want to be in interaction with, so the, sh so the Shichi followed the orders and attacked them and killed many Westerners inside Japan and inside the waters of Japan, bombarding, kind of attacking the sh vessels around. And so this did not sit well with many, uh, many of those barbar, quote unquote, barbarian cultures. They they came back and started bombarding the the headquarters of the Shichi, which were again the Cho. Chosu and Satsuma areas of Japan. The Shishi did try to try to take Kyoto and secure the emperor's support, but the shogunate was too strong, strong for him and repelled them. The sho uh, <clears throat> uh, the sh the sh shogun shogun took direct control of the Choshu region directly and. Try to return, you know, law and order to the region, but it failed. The Shishi regrouped, reorganized, and with the Brit and British help, they 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 went on the offensive again with a new mantra: Japanese spirit, Western technology. They actually, and then the rebellion, the rebellion retook Choshu and started to gain strength as other daimyo were starting to ignore the shogun. Though, though this, though this is where where the shakeup happens, as both Komei and Iemochi, the shogunate and the emperor respectively, died within two years of each other. For first Komei died, and and then Iemochi, and uh, Komei was succeeded by Meiji, who was like I think fourteen at the time, and then Mochi was uh, succeeded by Yoshi Yoshinobu. Again, I'm so sorry for the pronunciation in this uh, And they, and Yoshi, and this didn't really mean anything because the people were still going on. People, the Choshu were still going. But, not the Choshu, the Satsuma and Choshu, which they formalized their alliance into the Satcho. Uh, what's it called? But, when, what's it called? Yoshinobu finally caught wind of this new alliance, 
uh, he he got help of a friction visor, well, and uh, was well, the, the Sancho became very very zealous in their their uh, aims. They wanted to, they didn't want to uh, what's it called? They wanted to re remove the Shogun and restore the Emperor as the rightful ruler of Japan. And a little little bit of side note here, uh, I thought. It's kind of interesting how the British and the French were once again at odds, pretty much doing a little Cold War thing in Japan. I just thought it was kind of funny, but especially considering they actually did both have colonies in in that area at the time. But that's neither here nor there. Let's get now. Let's get back to the story. So Yoshimi would try to compromise where he would resign as the Shogunate. And he would, but he would still be in the cabinet of the emperor. Sancho were very, very unsatisfied with this and tried to pressure the teen, teen emperor, I think, to restore full imperial authority in 1868. Yoshinobu was extremely outraged at this call and called upon the those daimyo who were still loyal to him and to, to take Kyoto, restore order, and and restore the shogunate to his full power. And now the now this was the beginning of what would be known as the Boshin War, which was the final, pretty much the nail in the coffin for the final death of the you know, shogunate. The Sancho, where represented the imperial court, was was up against the Tokugawa shogunate. The first battle was in Kyoto, right, and right in 1868, where and despite the number of the sh the show, despite their disadvantage in no numbers, the Sacho were extremely well equipped compared to the Shogunate. The Shogunate push was pushed back by this w extremely well equipped Sacho alliance, and <clears throat> was put retreating all the way to Edo, whilst the Sacho secured all south all was all of Japan southwest of Edo. Mm. Whilst the and uh, well, southwest of Kyoto, apologies. The British, the British ambassador who was helping this uh, line, this uh, new little uh, rebellion, uh, Parks, one Mr. Parks, made sure no other European power was intervened in the in Japan, besides probably France, which was already intervening at the time. <laughs> uh, anyway, the, he thought the imperial. Because he thought the Imperial forces had a good fighting chance against the Shogunate, Shogunate and wanted to see them succeed. So, Sai... And now, let's mention Saigo Takamori, with the leader of the Sacho Alliance, had, by May 1868, had the Shogun fully surrender, and Edo had, by extension, and had Edo, and by extension, many daimyo centered there as well. But the Northerners were very inflexible, and and uh, what was it called? Formed the Northern Alliance and tried in uh, what was it called resistance to this. But that was, not, you know, that was not to last too long. They they clubbed themselves, but then got defeated in October. The Imperial Court moved the capital from Kyoto to Edo, Edo, renaming it. Uh, I think. Oh, wait, they didn't rename it. It would be. I was just mentioning how is Tokyo now, apologies. The last popular resistance was in the island of uh, Hokkaido. And they they formed what would be the short-lived Republic of Ezo, being crushed in 1869. And that was the final... And call, then there was a calm, with the token Gawa clan finally quashed, and the Emperor C and the Emperor's back to power, the, the land of Tokugawa and every other daimyo was seized by the emperor. Well, more so as cabinet. And Germany, Japan was fully centralized. And since uh, Meiji was kind of a little bit, like I mentioned before, he was like, I think 15 at the time of this, he was too young to rule, and uh, a lot of young bureaucratic samurai set, set to modernize and unify the Japanese people, because beforehand they were more royal to the daimyo than the Emperor or the Shogun. It's a little bit. They also, what's it called? They also implemented uh, the 
a lot of humongous changes to the Japanese people. From public education, social mobility, a conscript army, and all of it was hated by the majority of the public. They saw it as a corruption of their true values. It was no longer Japanese spirit, Western technology. It was Western spirit, Western technology. With their, with, ja with Japan and the spirit being quashed by the samurai trying to modernize. The cabinet, what is it called, trying to, with, with what the cabinet was doing, they were trying to achieve what took many European countries hundreds of years, if not hundreds upon hundreds of years. And uh, the most, the most uh, upset of this were the samurai because they were obsolete because no, they were no longer the warriors of the society. They, their privileges were entirely stripped off of them, and their and then soon, and the few hier hierarchy would kind of, you know, give them the, those privileges and was replaced by more Western nationalistic ideals. And Sai Saigo Takamori, uh, the same guy who led a sideshow, proposed that also old samurai could be used for a invasion of Korea, but it was rejected, and rejected by the cabinet. So Takamori left the cabinet, and this all led up to the Satsuma Rebellion, which was the last time samurai stood up against the winds of change. Though, though it was in Saigo's mess. And uh, Saigo, this message uh, was it called of us was by Saigo Takamori, like uh, re resonate with his hometown of Sats home not town, excuse me, home region of Satsume to a point it caused extreme tension in the region. It all culminate cum culminated when the Meiji government tried to assassinate Saigo, causing the region to, to rebel to protect their hero. Saigo, Saigo rounded up the as many troops as he could, and start and prepared, uh, prepared an army and mar to march on Tokyo in 1877, and demand answers from the increasingly unpopular government in in Tokyo. They met, they met resistance in the Kumato ca Castle. They laid siege on the castle until eventually being pushed back by the conscript army. Their last. And then their last stand was in the Battle of Shiroyama, in which they were outnumbered sixty to one. Uh, on that day, that day was a bloodbath for the samurai. And uh, there's a even a very well known picture in Japanese culture, where the last forty samurai warriors attack, do the do a last charge, a suicidal charge against the conscript army as a set. As Saigo himself commit, committed honorable seppuku. With the with this, the rebellion was lost. And the even though the rebellion lost lost every single battle of the war, they they were honored by the government because they are so so this the government and the court Piro court saw them as brave and, and Meiji even pardoned Sa Saigo post the. Uh, Mortem? Post-mortem, yes. The man was a tragic hero in Japan for that time. And to honor the these fallen warriors, the, the Bushido Code, the Samurai Code, was put into uh, effect in the in the uh, an army. And thus was thus is the end to uh uh, excuse me. Thus was the end of this, the age of the samurai, the age of the age of the daimyo. Shogunate was gone. The sa last of the samurai quashed. Now the new government full had full control of Japan. The ma the the Meiji government modernized as best as could, and now they. And now, with the new power they have gained, they could finally resist Western power. But, as we all know, that it would, as we all know, it would not turn out now well for Japan, as this, as their, as their new nationalistic spirit 
sent sent them on their path to demise in World War II. I would like every thank everybody for listening to this.